In his review of William Morris's work, which would become the infamous conclusion to the Renaissance, Walter Pater writes, The composite experience of all the ages is part of each one of us. To deduct from that experience, to obliterate any part of it, to come face to face with the people of a past age, as if the Middle Age, the Renaissance, the 18th century had not been, is as impossible as to become a little child, or enter again into the womb and be born. Pater rejects the idea that we can ever know the past as it was. Instead, we can only say what the past means to us now, a meaning that is inflected by everything that has come between then and now. In today's paper, I want to consider Pater's engagement with the historical past, which in this quotation he tells us must always be a mediated experience, and the composite experience that he presents to us in his only novel, Marius the Epicurean. Scholars have long noted the unusual temporality, the prevalence of anachronisms, in this novel. Charles Martindale calls it a layered transhistoricism, while James Porter dubs it temporal estrangement, and William Shooter calls it a form of literary palaginesis, or rebirth. Carolyn Williams has compared it to a sculptural relief, in which different epochs form the foreground and background, brought into close juxtaposition. I suggest that the unusual temporality of Marius should be read in the light of the construction and reconstruction of history in the 19th century museum, which, after the mid-century, began displaying their collections chronologically, reorganizing history into a progressive continuum which not only invited, but demanded, comparison between epochs, what I'm calling the museological gaze. The novel moves not just between the late 19th century, where the narrator explicitly sits, and 2nd century Rome, where the action takes place, but also all times and places in between. The reader's never at home in Marius's Rome, but constantly reminded of his or her temporal distance from the events of the novel, and explicitly invited to compare Rome to the present day, and also to the centuries which stretch between. So, for example, on the first page of the novel, we're confronted with William Wordsworth. A sense of conscious powers, external to ourselves, pleased or displeased by the right or wrong conduct of every circumstance of daily life, that conscience, of which the old Roman religion was a formal, habitual recognition, was become in him a powerful current of feeling and observance. The old-fashioned, partly puritanic awe, the power of which Wordsworth noted and valued so highly in the northern peasantry, had its counterpart in the feeling of the Roman lad. According to Pater, then, the way a reader of 1885 is to understand the religion Marius practices in the second century, which is itself an outdated holdover from a much earlier age, is through comparison with Wordsworth's poetry, which, at the time Pater published the novel, was itself nearly a century old. Thus, along with anyone who reads the novel after its year of publication in 1885, we learn about the religion of Numa, the title of this chapter, through three points of mediation, Pater himself, in the 1880s, Wordsworth at the end of the 18th century, and Marius in the 2nd century. Equally, when Marius turns to Epicureanism to deal with the death of his friend Flavian, America, which during the timeline of the novel is still 1600 years away from coming into being, rears its head in a quotation from Goethe's Wilhelm Meister's Apprenticeship. And so the abstract apprehension that the little point of this present moment alone really is between a past which has just ceased to be and a future which may never come, became practical with Marius, under the form of a resolve, as far as possible, to exclude regret and desire and yield himself to the improvement of the present with an absolutely disengaged mind. America is here and now, here or nowhere, as Wilhelm Meister finds out one day, just not too late, after so long looking vaguely across the ocean for the opportunity of the development of his capacities. At the very moment Marius declares that the past is gone and the future may never come, Pater reminds us of the very long stretch of time that is Marius's future and our past, a stretch of time that remains present and relevant to his readers. As James Porter describes it, as Marius is leaning forward into the future, we, Pater's contemporaries and posthumous readers, are leaning into the past, straining to get hold of that era in all its fragile presence. The present may be all we have, but in Pater's writing, each moment of the present is alive with what came before it and what will come after it. I argue that this technique recreates the experience of visiting a museum and seeing different ages placed before one in a row. The chronological displays of the Victorian Museum encourage teleological thinking. 
in which each singular object or moment within the progressive continuum of history is both inflected by what came before it, but also prefigures what comes after. As Donald Preziosi notes, the spatio-temporal dramaturgy of the modern historical museum, which renders time and space as sequence and succession, creates a syntactical relation between present and the past connected in a causal relationship of incompletion and fulfillment. This presentation suggests that the past of an artifact is an incomplete manifestation or prologue to what has now come to pass. Thus, every artifact is the relic of an absence, of an absent past which at the same time prefigures our present, which in turn fulfills, completes, or proves what the past imagines as its future. It is this sense of a single moment which is both the fulfillment of its own past and a prophecy of its future that structures the temporality of Marius. The display practices of the 19th century museum explicitly strove to show the big picture, whether of the natural world, the history of art, or the history of human civilization. The physical space of the museum created a sense of temporal distance, looking back over long stretches of time, which was considered necessary for reflection and appropriate judgment, and also allowed comparisons to be drawn between different time periods set side by side. These, reflection and comparison, are the two purposes of the museological gaze in Marius. People of a poetic temper, Pater argues in the novel, live in memory. Amid all that eager grasping at the sensation, the main point of economy in the conduct of that present was the question, how will it look to me? At what shall I value it this day next year? That, in a given day or month, one's main concern was its impression for the memory. This quotation comes at the height of Marius's hedonism, and yet does not look like hedonism as we would traditionally think of it. For Marius, as for Pater, living for the moment is living for the memory of the moment, which is why careful observation is so crucial. Because of the vast sweeps of time Pater incorporates into the, into the novel, the text transcends personal memory to become about cultural memory, the composite experience that Pater described earlier what a specific age means to those who come after it. Thus, the anachronisms of the novel manifest in two ways. Explicit comparison between the ages, as we saw in the references to Wordsworth and Goethe, and the interposition of the museum and the archive as a way of mediating the past through the present. For instance, the depiction of a religious procession early in the novel is mediated by the Parthenon frieze on display in the British Museum. The old sculptors of the great procession on the frieze of the Parthenon at Athens have delineated that pla the placid heads of the victims led into sacrifice with a perfect feeling for the animals, in forcible contrast with any indifference as to their suffering. This comparison both familiarizes and estranges. It helps readers to visualize the scene by referencing a well-known work of art, but it also reminds us of the vast stretch of time between these living animals and the fragmentary stone on display in the modern museum. Equally, when the counsellor to the emperor meets Aurelius' children, he's struck by the likeness of the children to their father. But this again is presented to the reader through the spectre of the museum. Like the modern visitor to the Capitoline and some other museums, Fronto had been struck, pleasantly struck, by the family likeness among the Antonines. The flesh and blood children before us in the narrative transform in this moment to stately colourless busts in the museum, their chiselled features reflecting their familial line. In both these examples, Pater uses the museological gaze to identify the eternal within the flux of transient time. The fleeting moments and impressions of the past are fixed in stone, as in the Parthenon frieze, and created anew with each new viewer, as in the visitors to the Capitoline. The comparisons between different time periods have the same purpose. They find points of similarity within seemingly very different time periods, and thus identify what is eternal or universal. As Carolyn Williams notes, the historical form of Marius the Epicurean figuratively places the different spirits of two different ages side by side, but in the end these turn out to be merely different phases of the same overarching spirit. It is this which explains how, for Pater, Romanticism can appear in 2nd century Rome, or the Renaissance be traced in 12th century France. The spirit of these two movements is something eternal in human nature. It's never new, but merely reappears in new forms throughout the ages. Pater's wider project, through all his body of work, is finding these points of stability within a seemingly ever-changing chaotic world. He tries to find 
fixity within the flux. He seeks, as he says in his History of Philosophy, knowledge transcending mere temporal experience, that which remains fixed throughout time and change, just as the goal of all philosophy, he argues in Plato and Platonism, is to realize unity in variety. The long span of history offered to him by classical studies provides the scope to find the unity which transcends time. And in Marius, as in much of Pater's work, what is eternal is art, either in the physical objects that long outlast the fleshly bodies they represent, or in the artistic spirit that manifests in age after age. Pater constructs history through the series of elevated points of the supreme artistic productions of each generation that he described in the Renaissance. Each point of comparison throughout Marius is a work of art or philosophy. Wordsworth, Goethe, Gautier, Dante, Montaigne, Shakespeare, Raphael, Tennyson, Rousseau. In the Renaissance, Pater distinguished between the conditions of time and place which mark a work of art as belonging to a certain historical period, he calls these the elements of change in art, and the element of permanence, which is independent of time and place, which he calls genius. It's only through comparison and reflection, through looking over the series of elevated points, that one can distinguish the elements of change from the elements of permanence. And the element of permanence is an answer to decadence and the terrifying whirl of impressions that make up the flux, that continual vanishing away, that strange, perpetual weaving and unweaving of ourselves that he describes in the conclusion to the Renaissance. In much the same way that every moment in Marius contains both its past and present, and thus is both belated and anticipatory, each work of art contains this element of permanence, and thus is both new and old. One of the central images of the novel is that of Cecilia's house, the home of nascent Christianity. The house is a kind of museum in which the remains of older art have been arranged and harmonized to give them a new and singular expressiveness. Porter has pointed to this passage as symptomatic of decadence, in which everything that is new is itself already decrepit and antique, a foregone conclusion. It is old before it can be new. Yet, I would argue that the opposite is also true, and more pressing to Pater. Everything old is simultaneously new again. Because everything is a composite experience, constantly changed by a new generation looking back, mediated by what comes after it, everything, though old, is also fresh, a word that Pater uses a staggering number of times in the novel, far more than the descriptors of decadence that we might expect to encounter, like ruin, fragment, or broken. Pater sets the novel in a period of decadence, the end of Rome, but also of nascence, the beginning of Christianity. And importantly, he traces the spirit of the early Christian church through the religion of Numa that Marius practices and all the way back to ancient Greece, demonstrating that while nothing is ever new, equally nothing is ever old, nothing comes to a true end. The eternal spirit is constantly being remade. The description of Cecilia's house makes it clear that Pater's thinking about reception is explicitly inflected by the museum, and the ways in which museums fundamentally change the objects they display through the very act of displaying them, as museum studies scholars commonly note. Brought into the museum, an object is stripped of its original cultural meaning, and now refers only to itself, itself indicating both its material essence and the self-enclosed history of the medium, as Douglas Grimp writes. This is a process that Philip Fisher calls resocialization, which has the power, as Fisher says, to declare new wholes. Thus, the museum strips away the very conditions of time and place, the historical and social context of an object, which Pater deemed to be the elements of change, leaving only that which is permanent and eternal behind. Pater's various writings on philosophy have often been deemed inconsistent by scholars, as he seems to move between materialism and idealism, I suggest, however, that the majority of his writing is united by an adherence to subjective idealism. He wishes to maintain the ideal of Platonism, something absolute, eternal, and stable, but to incorporate the importance of subjective impressions. He achieves this in part by recasting art, or the spirit of genius, the element of permanence, not as a second-order imitation, as Plato would have it, a mere imitation of reality, but as the ideal itself. Thus, in Winkelmann, Pater writes, take a work of Greek art, the Venus of Melos. That is in no sense a symbol, a suggestion of anything beyond its own victorious fairness. 
The mind begins and ends with a finite image, yet loses no part of the spiritual motive. In the platonic approach to the museum, the fragmentary object is a gateway to the complete ideal. In contrast, Pater refuses the power of the aesthetic gaze to convert the object into a symbol. For Pater, the finite image is enough. The spiritual motive, that is, the ideal, is contained within it rather than beyond it. This ideal, detached as it is from metaphysical ideas of absolute truth, can be interpreted subjectively by the viewer, and in fact must be, as it's only through new interpretation that art can be kept forever fresh. Change, therefore, paradoxically guarantees permanence, while the act of interpretation, of reflection and comparison, reveals that which is eternal. In this way, Pater marries idealism with subjectivity and finds stability within the flux. Thank you very much for listening.